Hello everyone and welcome to another exciting edition of the ESQ Practical Lawyers Academy free webinar series. We are glad you all could join us here today. My name is Chidima Abu and I am a research and development associate at ESQ Training Limited and I will also be a moderator for today's webinar. So at ESQ Training Limited, our mission is to expand the frontiers of continuous professional learning and with courses and trainings across various areas of practice. We have tagged this webinar series, launch our webinar series, as they are slated to hold at 1 p.m. during lunch break, the whole three times every week, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. However, in order to accommodate our Muslim participants, the Friday webinars will hold at 11 a.m. And after every session, we would provide the resources in easily accessible format for everyone who is interested. So our training on mining agreements, contracts, and transaction issues starts on the 19th of April and runs to 23rd of April, and it goes for just 100,000 naira. And our five weeks training on the mechanics of oil and gas contracts, it runs through 22nd of April to 20th of March, and it goes for 200,000 naira. So um, if you're interested in this, any of these trainings I mentioned, please just let me know in the chat session. So you can now watch all our webinars and training trainings on our YouTube with the link that will be sent in the chat box. And please, when you're done watching these past webinars are present, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. So on today's topic um, on the webinar, we have um, Hotel Law Essentials, Franchising and Management Agreement. And some of the things that will be discussed today will be um, understanding the players active in the hospitality industry, um, differentiating between the management agreement relationship and franchise agreement relationship, um, exploring the industry fundamentals that are the foundation for the relationships of the parties, identifying strategies for the future, and many more that our awesome panelists would be touching on today. So if you have any question while the webinar is ongoing, please type in the Q&A or raise your hand, and in due time, it will be answered. So um, we would like to introduce our panelists for today. Um, we have Olaniro Osotui, yes, he's senior associate at Olaniro Jai Law Practice. Yes, so um, we are meant to have Jimmy Kafilis, but she's a little bit under the weather. So we hope you get her soon, Ms. Jimika. So today we also have Trevor Ward. He's the managing director of the Hospitality Group and the chairman of Hotel Partners Africa. He's a specialist consultant in hospitality, leisure, and real estate industries. He's the managing director of Lagos based W hospitality group, like I mentioned. His industry experience spans over over 20, over 40 years, sorry, and includes advising clients on hotel, tourism, and leisure development in over 90 countries across the globe and in 39 countries in, in Africa. So with a special focus on Sub-Saharan Africa, he works with many of the international hotel groups seeking a presence there and with financial institution investors and entrepreneurs across the continent. He is regarded as one of the foremost experts on the hotel industry in Sub-Saharan Africa and is engaged primarily in development consultancy, ranging from investment appraisals to operator selection, asset management, valuation and agencies. Thank you, Trevor, for joining us today and we are honored to have our panelists on the webinar today. So um, I would like to do a little bit introduction of the topic before I leave it to my panelists to handle. So generally, um, hospitality law is a legal and social um, practice related to the treatment of a person's guests or those who patronize the place of business. Hospitality law are intended to protect both hosts and guest agents, um, injury, whether accidental or intentional. So aside the law, other things are essential to hotel laws like the management agreement, hospitality agreement, and franchising agreement. And there are lots of complexities. And these agreements that, if not well negotiated, often hinder the success of projects. So on this webinar, um, it will provide a brief introduction 
to management agreement and franchise agreement in the hospitality industry today. And this webinar is intended to be a practical guide to the issues that face lawyers and industry leaders in general working in the hospitality field and to develop a deeper understanding in the manage, manager owner and franchisor franchisee relationship and the complexities of this relationship that dominates the hotel industry so i don't want to talk too much so i'll just leave it to the experts to handle this webinar properly so for sure but thank you uh, i'll leave this topic for you to dissect thank you so much thanks jadima thanks for that introduction um yes. i i um, i'm sure most of that was true um, delighted to say I'm actually up to 40 countries now, um, having worked in Somalia, actually Somali land, uh, last year. So I, I managed to tick off uh, an another African country. Um, so, okay, so you've asked me to make a presentation. Uh, let me see if we can get the sharing screen to work um, properly. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, you, I can. I can see your screen. Can you, see, you, can, you can see it in full um, in full screen mode, yeah? Yes, I can. Excellent. Okay. Um, all right. So, um, yeah, Managing Director W Hospitality Group, Lagos based. Um, I've been based in Lagos for almost 20 years now. Uh, I have an office over there in Aniru, on, on the Aniru estate. Um, and uh, been working throughout Africa from that office. Um, you've uh, seen me today, uh, as many people, I, I'm working from home uh, and uh, very pleasantly surprised at how, how well that, that has worked, um, although uh, there's nothing like face-to-face -face, uh, uh, dealings. So uh, one day we'll, we'll, we'll be back in the same room. Uh, but for now, I'm gonna make a, a presentation about um, one of my specialist subjects, which is hotel management agreements. Now, one thing I've, I've found out um, is that management agreements between owners and hoteliers, they're unique agreements. Uh, they're not, they're, such a, a relationship doesn't exist in any other industry uh, globally, which means that there's a lot of misunderstanding because if you've never worked with a hotel management agreement you can't be expected to understand what it's all about um and and some of this uh, some of uh, the, the, the the misunderstandings i'll try and clear up today but but there's nothing like getting good advice when you when you actually do plunge in so International hotel chains, love them or hate them. Uh, you can decide which uh, side of that fence you sit on. Um, these are the chains that are currently working in Nigeria. Um, some of them are, are, are well known to you, like uh, Hilton uh, and Best Western. Uh, others are, and Radisson, others are, are perhaps less well known, but, but are, have a, a full presence. I mean, so goes Sun is actually the parent company of Southern Sun. Accor is the parent company of Novotel and, and Ibis and Mercure. Louvre, Golden Tulip, uh, Marriott. Um, they're a relative newcomer, but they actually have one of the oldest hotels or two of the oldest hotels in, in Nigeria in their stable, which is the, the Sheraton in Abuja and, and the Sheraton in Akeja, uh, Swiss International Bond. So those are the ones that are, that are currently operating. And, and between them, they have 49 hotels th throughout Nigeria, 20 of them in Lagos, nine of them in, a, in, in Abuja, 5,900 rooms, nearly 6,000 rooms that these guys brand. And then these are the ones that are, 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 have deals signed, many of them management agreements, uh, for future hotels. So the same, some of the same players there, Hilton, Best Western, Radisson, Accor at the top, uh, Louvre hotels with, with more Golden Tulip hotels, but some newcomers there, which is includes Four Seasons there in the center with a, with a project uh, ongoing in Lagos. Uh, Winder, uh, sorry, Hyatt, 
uh, one of the newcomers with projects in Abuja and Lagos signed, and, and Rotana there down at the bottom with a, with a project uh, also in Lagos, in, in Ikoi. Um, Marriott are due to open their Marriott branded hotel uh, up in Akeja in uh, April or May. May. Uh, next, next month is it's scheduled for. So partly uh, we're going to be, uh, th th this is a, a description of uh, how existing hotels in Nigeria, how they sit into a con continuum in, in terms of branding and control. So on the left-hand side there, you have the, the y-axis, which shows control down the bottom, uh, on, on the bottom left-hand side, uh, which shows zero control of the asset. And at the top, you have total control. Branding on the bottom, on the left-hand side, is no branding, uh, and on the right-hand side is, is total branding. Most of the hotels in Nigeria sit in what we call the mom and pop. They are owner-operated hotels, often by a family. They're not branded, and, and the owners are in total control of, of the asset. They decide when to open. They decide what's on the menu and, and how the beds are made. And then you have uh, the likes of Best Western, uh, which is actually a, a marketing consortium but acts like a franchise. So that's why I put it slightly in the middle there, where the owner retains a lot of control and, and has a brand. Then you have the franchise, which is represented by uh, Evis in, in Lagos, Protea all, all throughout the country, Hawthorne Suites in Abuja and the Four Points in Lagos. All of those are franchises, not, not hugely common uh, in Nigeria, nor in Africa as a whole, but very, very common in, uh, in the States. And then down here on the right-hand side at the bottom is the management contract. All other branded hotels in Nigeria are management contracts where the owner has much less control, but has a hard branding. So, We have two parties to a hotel management to come, uh, contract. O on one side, you have the hotel owner who wants to build, wants to own a hotel and has the money to, to build it or, or, or buy it. And, and from the get-go recognizes the benefits of working with professionals. It's not a one-man band who's building it and, and, and designing it and, and managing it. But, the, the owner needs to recognize the benefit of working with professionals in, in, in all different fields and, and doesn't have the expertise to run that hotel and needs the hotel to be managed and therefore has started to speak to the hotel chains either directly or through a consultant like myself. And that hotel owner builds the hotel, owns the hotel, provides the money to run the hotel, the operating supplies, the working capital, provides the money to buy the food and the wine. And that owner receives information from the operator on the performance of the hotel, earns the profit and enjoys the increase in value of, of the asset over time when it's well run. But does not manage the hotel, does not hire the staff, does not interfere with the professionals. Because why would you buy a dog and bark yourself? Well, maybe that's because they do. The hotel operator, if you think in your mind of the Hiltons, the Marriotts, the Radissons, wants to operate hotels. That's their business and they have the expertise to do so and has invested millions of dollars in the development of a system to manage and market hotels, which is what the owner buys. But the operator has not the capital nor the desire to own hotels. Those brands that you can think of, they do not own hotels. One of the myths is that 
Hilton, Radisson, Marriott are going to build hotels in Africa. No, they're not. They do not build hotels. They need hotel owners to build those hotels, and they use that manage that system to run, to manage and market those hotels on behalf of owners. So when you look at the investment in hotels globally, the operator has a very low, if zero, investment in hotels. The owner has the investment, the high investment. The owner, when it comes to control, has low control, not zero, but low control. And the operator has very high day-to-day -day control. And that perhaps is where this dichotomy comes in and where you find the myths are being promoted and the disagreements are rising because the owner has very high investment but low control. The operator has low investment but high control. Sometimes owners have a difficulty on understanding that that is the business model. So why hire an operator in the first place? Well, most hotel owners, and, and, and this is individuals and corporations, they can't manage hotels. They've never done it. They don't know how to do it. No hotel owner can match the marketing strength of an operator. When you're talking about uh, a, 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 a a branded operator, all of them have millions, tens of millions of people that follow that operator through the loyalty scheme. The Marriott Bonvoy, the, uh, the Hilton Honours. They are loyal or they have loyalty to that brand. An owner cannot match that. So what opportunity costs? Well, if your business is in, is in construction or trading or whatever it is, if you're managing the hotel yourself, you're not paying attention to your other businesses. You don't have the competitive strength and you want to delegate responsibility to professionals. The operator brings to the table that multi-million dollar investment in a brand and marketing system, the recognized brand, I call it the neon sign on top of the hotel that flashes and, draw and attracts attention. Expertise in every single aspect of hotel management, proven systems and procedures, training programs, terribly important, and sales teams, people who actually use the shoe leather and go and knock on doors. In other words, the ability to operate the hotel better than can that owner. So why the tension? Well, not all marriages are made in heaven. They say that most management agreements last longer than the average marriage. Um, so why the tension? Because there are fees and other charges. There's no measure of performance. The length of contract can be an issue. This control I talked about and perception and understanding, which is often lacking. I mentioned fees and other charges. There are technical services fees. There are pre-opening fees. There are management fees basic and incentive, there's a marketing fee, there's reservations fees and there's training fees and there's probably other fees and charges which the operator charges to the owner. Yeah, but, well, hotels are complicated animals to manage. If you imagine in a big hotel how many people are moving around and have to be managed, staff and, and, and guests and suppliers and others. Um, how many transactions a day in a big hotel? In a competitive environment, a branded hotel typically wins the race. 
any car that you own needs oil and petrol and brake fluid and balance wheels and the mechanic charges for all of them and an operator charges for all of them as well. When they talk about performance, the operator is incentivized through the fee structure to perform. A large part of the management fees, I mentioned two management fees, a basic fee and incentive fee. A large part of that fee is actually based on profit. So the management company is incentivized to, to maximize rent revenues, optimize ex management, uh, operating expenses, and therefore maximize the profit that is being generated. However, there are rarely any measures or workable measures of performance and, and few sanctions uh, when there is perceived underperformance. And the operator earns its fees before the owner receives any return. The length of contract can be an issue, typically 15 to 20 years, with no ability for the owner to terminate early. 15 to 20 years, I'm aware of, of operators which sign 50 years or more. The issue of control, which is one of the biggest uh, issues. Does the owner effectively give up all control? No, but it does depend on the maturity and ability of the owner to manage his or her investment. And that's an important point about the maturity and ability of the owner. Not everybody is a good hotel owner. Perception and understanding is the crux of the matter. Does the owner really understand the meaning of a management contract? I, I did mention that they're unique. If an owner signs a management agreement, particularly one which is for 20 years, millions of dollars are involved, should that owner have read that contract? Of course they should, and they should have understood it, every single word and punctuation mark. When an owner says they never, they didn't actually read the contract, that owner is not a good hotel owner. In a hot market, can the owner really see the value of what the operator brings to the table? If everybody is performing at 80% occupancy, room occupancy, then do they really need an operator? Does the operator really understand the owner with whom they're doing business? So some solutions to the tensions. It is a fact that owners, not every owner, but owners of large, certainly of larger hotels, they need operators. Operators also need owners. Remember, they don't build their own hotels. They need owners to build hotels for them to brand and manage. This management agreement model works at tens of thousands of hotels worldwide, including many in Africa. And it has worked since the 1950s when the first Hilton management agreement was signed. There's no fundamental misalignment objective of objectives. The misunderstandings and tensions occur between people. People have misunderstandings, not contracts. Read the contract. The owner, the operator is the one that generates that contract. They operate hundreds, if not thousands of hotels, and they're not going to have different contracts for different hotels. They will have a boilerplate contract, which yes, can be negotiated and changed slightly, but generally speaking, it is an operator um, generated contract and the owner owes it to himself or herself to read 
the contract. Fees are negotiated and tend to be the first thing discussed. They are negotiated and agreed before you sign the contract, not afterwards. And as in any relationship, disputes are better settled by dialogue between people, not by throwing away the contract. An owner who is a first time owner, who has other things to do, appoints an asset manager as a professional interface. It's a layer of ownership, it's a layer of management between the owner and the operator. The asset manager knows the hotel, knows the hotel operator, knows how the relationship works and how the industry works, and knows when to intervene and when not to. And a good asset manager is advising both the owner and the operator. And the operator needs sometimes to change as well and must acknowledge that their demands for control are sometimes seen as unreasonable. Um, we talk about a marriage, we talk about a partnership, sometimes own operators forget that and forget who invested the money to build the hotel. And, and this is a... Uh, this, this, this is a, a problem sometimes to, to discuss. Operators must be more willing to share risk with the owner. Now, we have seen that in, during the pandemic last year, where the big operators agreed to stand aside on their fees, agreed to uh, cut their fees in, in, in some cases so that they were sharing the downside risk. I hope that's been a useful background to the relationship that the relationships that are there between owners and and operators um i can't i haven't delved into the detail it's too big uh to to cover in in one webinar the the details of a management agreement are in sometimes hundreds of pages uh, and i know of op some operators who have six different agreements uh to plow through and to understand and read. So thank you for listening to my presentation. Uh, I hand it back to uh, Chidima. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? I hear you fine. Do you want to take back the screen? <laughs> okay, <laughs> yes. Um, so I have a few questions, or should I ask them after um, the other panelists, panelists present? As, as you wish, I suggest though it might be fresher to, to ask your question now. Okay, all right. So you mentioned um, an operator can handle more than one hotel. Am I right? I'm sorry, yes. I didn't hear that. You mentioned um, in your presentation that um, a, an operator can handle more than one hotel. No, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm Trevor, not here. Trevor I, she started by saying that um, you mentioned in the course of your presentation that an operator could um, effectively be managing more than one hotel. I mean, in relation to chains. So she's talking about chains of hotels. A manager, a, a, a management. An, oper company. an operator. Yeah, so, so what's the question? So the question is, um, if an operator can handle more than one chain of hotel, how, where is the place of um, confidentiality and the um, non-compete agreement in, hotel, in the hotel industry, basically? Uh, okay, do, do, do you mind if I respond to that? Yes. Okay, I, because I, I think it's more of a uh, question. Um, and I think Trevor is going to be able to speak to the, to the issue as well. Um, but fundamentally, you would understand that um, the the relationship um, between the operator and the owner is very um, unique. And speaking from uh, um, the owner's perspective, 
in most of these agreements, you would see that there are certain territorial non-compete provisions um, that essentially would say that an operator cannot undertake um, the management of um, an hotel of a similar standing within a defined territory. Um, so, so as to avoid questions of conflict, questions of breach of confidence. Because uh, if, for instance, um, Protea is managing one hotel in Lekki and then managing another one owned by another person or uh, another corporate in, in Ikeja, as it actually is, um, the, there are no concerns as to conflict because they, they are occupying different parts of the city. And so uh, the concern or the risk as to breach of confidence or conflict of interest is very remote. As a matter of fact, information sharing may actually be very helpful. And as Trevor rightfully mentioned, um, loyalty in the industry, especially in relation to operators, is very fundamental to the success of the business. So I'm coming into Nigeria, I'm coming into Nigeria from wherever it is I'm coming. Um, I go in late into Lagos and, you know, I have, I've already got this relationship with Protea. I stay there close to the airport in Ikeja, but then my business meetings are somewhere around Lekki. When I'm leaving Ikeja, I would ask them, of course, they would tell me that they, they've got another hotel that they're operating, you know, um, in another axis of the city. So, so that's helpful in that regard. It doesn't undermine or, you know, it doesn't remove from the fact that confidentiality in relation to the operation of the hotel or each hotel must be protected. Okay, okay. So, um, Trevor? Yeah. Okay, so I have another, I think um, Olaniro has um, answered the question, the first question I have I had for you. I don't know if you heard him well, so you want to add something else? Uh, you, you, are you suggesting I add something to, yes, to what? Yes, if you have anything to add. Like, like any any um, any issue in a in a management agreement, it's a huge subject, and um, any business has competition, um, and it it's better that Protea operate um, a competing competing hotel than than somebody else because there can be synergies between uh, two hotels that. That are under the same brand and same operator if the owners agree for example sharing sales uh, expenses sharing maintenance expenses things like that they call it clustering um in 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 terms of uh what we call it aop area of protection but uh, owners it, it it's in it in the owner's interest especially when a, a hotel is building its business in the early years that another hotel under the same brand does not open in the same area and 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 compete, um, as I say, when when the business is building. So it is not unusual for an operator to agree not to uh, manage or or franchise another hotel under that same brand within a specified area, typically a radius. Uh, um, for, on the map um, within a specified time. Yes, you are now facing a, a, um, a conflict because the owner is trying to protect their business and the operator is trying to protect their business. The operator wants to earn as many, much fees as they can from as many hotels as they can. And the owner typically has one hotel and wants to maximize the profit from that one hotel. Again, you, 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 can, you can tie it down within an agreement, uh, but at the end of the day, it's all about dialogue. And there are matters of duties of faith and fiduciary uh, care uh, that come into those relationships. Um, but if, a, if an operator is seriously upsetting an owner uh, an existing owner because of a, a, a desire to do a new hotel, then then nobody is willing winning. So it is better to discuss and agree uh, a, a, a compromise, if you like, than than from the the operator to go ahead willy nilly. Okay, thank you. Um, Olanira, you have 
Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you. So um, secondly, was it difficult for you to infiltrate the hotel industry in Nigeria when you started? Was it difficult for me? Yes. <laughs> well, okay, I'm an advisor, so I, 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 I originally was kind of dipping in and out from my London base, um, advising owners, uh, visiting Nigeria, advising owners, and then, and then going back to London. But I moved to Nigeria permanently in 2003. Um, what, was it difficult uh, in terms of working in the hotel industry? No. Was it difficult in adjusting to living in Lagos? Yes. <laughs> uh, I think any, anybody from, from London would, <laughs> would, would say the same. Um, but I'm not, I'm not saying that the hotel industry is a particular problem compared to what I was doing before. Okay, okay. Now, the final question. So, um, what are the necessary licenses you need to own a hotel in Nigeria, if any? If you have an idea of the licenses that we need to get? Well, I, I, I'll, I'll partly answer that question, but I'll answer a, a different question as well. I, I'm not an expert in hotel operations. Um, but there, there are licenses required to operate a hotel in Nigeria, like there are in any city or, or country in the world. Uh, and, and that's quite right um, in terms of protection, uh, protecting the environment, protecting the customer, protecting the employees, et cetera, et cetera. The, the list of licenses that you require is very long. I can't possibly tell you what they all are. Um, so I, I'm dodging that question. What, what I will tell you, though, is that we as an industry are very, very visible. We are almost by definition on the high street. We, we cannot be a factory in a tucked away industrial estate where no one sees us. We want to be seen. Because of that, and, and because of the, the visibility of our, of our buildings, the visibility of our business, where people see people going out, where the authorities see people going in and out and spending money, uh, we are a target for the authorities to tax us, to license us, to levy us. And in certain jurisdictions, which don't need naming, um, the state governments are, they need money, uh, and they see hotels and they say, right, we will charge those hotels uh, and we'll think up of licenses that you need to dig a borehole, build a borehole, operate a water treatment plant, and then we'll charge you for the water that comes out of your borehole. We'll charge you for your lift and your boilers and your fridges and your everything else. Uh, and if you don't pay, we'll close you down. So the point I'm making is that the industry does tend to get overtaxed, over licensed compared with other industries that, 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 I, that I have contact with. So the number of licenses is, is big and big and big and growing. Uh, and um, uh, others uh, can probably supply that list. Mm. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That. It's, it's a very it's a laundry list of things and uh, well, as, as you mentioned, the, the taxation and you know, regime in relation to hotels is quite um, enormous and some might say it's actually um, capable of strangling operators and hotel owners capacity to operate and uh, even make any profit on, on, on their own takings in Nigeria. And, so, and it contributes to the very high cost of operating. In, yes, in many places, and, and therefore the perceived high prices uh, that hotels charge. I, I don't think they are high, um, 
but but that that's my perception. Others say very expensive. Why? And and we tell them about the licenses that the the, the hotel owners have to pay. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Trevor. Okay. Um, I'll stop so, sharing if you're taking the screen over. Okay. Okay. No problem. No problem. So, um, Alanya, I think you can make your presentation now. Um. Okay. Thank you very much. I'll share my screen now. Apologies, my my computer is angry. So, Alander, please, can you turn on your video? Yes, I'll do that. Just, um, just a minute. We also want to see your face. Yes, absolutely. I know. Uh, apologies, my computer is really angry now. Okay, um, can, can you see my screen now, please? I can see your screen. Okay, is it in slide mode, please? Yes, I can see it. Thank you. Yes. But we can't see your face yet, so. Um, I'm turning on you, sure. All right. All right, okay. Can you see me now? Yes, I can. Um, okay, um, thank, thank you very much. It's going to be a very um, quick run through the, through the presentation because Trevor has um, graciously um, had a quick run through the entire conversation. Uh, but, but the thing is, um, the conversation that we are having is fundamentally um, a, a having a pragmatic approach um, towards these uh, relationships. And again, as I mentioned at the start, I'm just here representing Mrs. Phillips, um, who unfortunately is not able to attend because she's not feeling very well. So um, at the core of this relationship, as, as um, Trevor mentioned, is interaction between owners and managers and different parties under these um, arrangements. Um, we know that these arrangements is about managing the interest of people, um, taking care of people, which is the core of hospitality business. Um, and at the center of these are these hotel management agreements and how people um, tend to deal with them for the purpose of running the business. Um, Trevor has run through most of, of the issues. So what I'm going to be doing is addressing those issues from a legal perspective, um, because I assume that you know, a significant number of people in the, in the audience um, are lawyers or commercial parties who want to have an understanding of how these things play out in, in transactions. Um, as already discussed, it's, it, you see this tension between owners and um, the operators. And this tension resulting from the divergence between ownership and control, because you know, by default, you would assume that if I own something, I should be able to control how it's run, how it's operated. Um, but when it comes to hotel uh, management arrangements, it's, it's the converse. You are the owner, but you're not the operator. The operator wants to have as much discretion as reasonably possible 
in the operation of the business uh, without significant interference from the owner so that it can run the business in a way that would um, optimize the operations, generate revenue, um, so that the operator, of course, can end his fees or its fees, um, and then, you know, profits are made by, by the owner. Uh, but as you can tell, these divergence of, of, of perspectives would always cause tensions in the relationship. And when we're talking about the, the different parties that you see in these arrangements, um, you know, um, Trevor had already mentioned the, 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 the asset manager. But what you would also see in the market sometimes, especially in emerging markets like, you know, um, Sub-Saharan Africa, what you see is that Hello? Hello? I think there's something wrong with um, Larry's um, network. You're still on mute. Sorry, can, I, I got a call for this. No problem, it's fine. Oh, okay. Um, is my screen still being shared? No, it's not. Okay, I apologize for that. Okay. Good. Um, can, can you see my screen now, please? Yes, I can. Thank, thank you very much. Um, so um, I was saying that the dynamics of this relationship can be simple and sometimes it can be very complex. Um, the simple ones, you know, the short piece of owner and the operator of and then you have the complex space of, you know, the government being um, the entity granting a concession of the assets to, to a person, to a corporate, and then the corporate now entering into the um, hotel management agreement with the operator for the purpose of running the business. And then you can also imagine scenarios where maybe prior to the granting of the concession, um, the, the assets had already been significantly leveraged um, to a commercial bank, or whatever, instead of even a private corporate um, that lends money, whether for working capital or you know for some capital expenditure expansion projects for the business, so much that um, the assets of the hotel um, have been used as security for those financing um, transactions. And so you see that sometimes it's not a simple relationship between the owner and the and the operator. Banks can be involved, the government can be involved, or their interests will be taken into account in entering into this relationship. Um, so, uh, I mean, from, from a lawyer's perspective, um, in approaching these uh, arrangements, you can't just say that, okay, I'm looking for legal issues, I'm looking for these sorts of issues. You have to be able to think um, commercially in reviewing these agreements. And as Trevor mentioned, typically, um, especially for but of to the arrangements. But then in, in, in some markets, you see that significant uh, review 
has to be done to be able to um, articulate the commercial expectation of the parties. Uh, as you can see on the slide, you say that you know, on one hand, you have the legal issues. Um, on the other hand, you have the commercial issues. But then when you pick up the documents, you see that there is a fusion of these, of, of these concerns so much that you can't just say that, okay, what, what you're concerned with in reviewing, drafting, negotiating these documents um, are just the, the, the legal considerations. You have to take into account you know, everything holistically. Um, so most of the things that, that, that um, you would see, uh, there's a multiverse of issues that, that are thrown up by these documents. But the key things that often throw up these tensions um, that were these tensions that were earlier mentioned are things around the term and the renewal. So from an appraiser's perspective, the appraiser wants to have security of position. You want to be secured knowing that um, you don't want to start a relationship and two years into it, when you've committed your resources, you've you know, committed the name of the brand to operating this hotel. And then the owner turns around and says that, um, sorry, I can't continue this relationship. From an operator's perspective, that is not beneficial. That is not profitable. So you see that the operator wants to have as long as reasonably practicable term in entering into the hotel management agreement. But, but the reality is it's not necessarily uh, detrimental to the interest of the owner that you have um, an appraiser who, is, who, who has a long term in, in the relationship. But the question for most owners, especially those without significant experience in the industry is, how am I going to be certain that performance is going to, to, um, to be on the optic when there is no incentive um, for, for, per, for performance because the arrangement is locked in. So these create a, a, a significant tension between the parties and it's always a problem. Um, I mean, there are legal considerations in relation to that because for instance, in Nigeria, um, you have no tab prescribing period of time when uh, management agreements can be in place and that they are subject to review and things like that. But from a commercial perspective, the owner is concerned that I don't want somebody who is um, who I'm not setting as to level of performance because we're just starting a relationship and then I have to be in bed with each person for 10, for 15 years or whatnot. So what you see in some other markets, which uh, Trevor can also speak to you know, in the US especially, you have very long durations and then when the relationship go, uh, the relationship gets tough between the parts, you have this uh, thing that uh, was put in the, in the, in the invite talking about a midnight rate. Uh, you know, it's, it's a situation where the, the owner just turns around um, what lawyers would call self-help and literally just kick out um, the, the appraisal. Um, the, the, the response to that has been you know, quite uh, oscillatory. In some markets, they would say that, okay, um, you can't force parties to enter into a contract or to remain in a contract, especially in relation to management services. Because the way it's been construed is that these contracts are contracts of personal service. And you know, we have a plethora of cases in Nigeria in relation to contract of, of, of service. Um, the court will not, for instance, um, grant specific performance of those sort of contract. So, but the question from the perspective of an operator is, if I'm in a situation like this, um, I've entered into this relationship. I am concerned that the owner of the hotel may change his mind or our mind or its mind and say that they're no, they're no longer interested in continuing the relationship. The question is, how do I manage my risk? One measure that you know have been has been put forward is having a liquidated damages arrangement. So you see some, some brands in the market under their management agreements, they would say that if you are going to terminate prior to the expiration of the term, then you would, as the owner, have to compensate them with the value of the fees that you would have earned at the agreement running full term. I mean, from a commercial perspective, that is sound and good for 
for the operator, um, a lawyer will pick that document and ask the question, right? okay, is this something that can fly in the event of a dispute? Because the concern is you don't want a compensatory mechanism in the agreement that will get to court and the court will strike it down. So for instance, under Nigerian law, before a liquidated damages or provision would be um, enforced by the, by the courts, you have to be able to demonstrate that that um, arrangement, that that arrangement or the value of the liquidated damages is a reasonable pre-estimate of the loss that will be suffered by the party that is getting compensated. So question is, um, how will the courts make that assessment? If the court comes to the conclusion that you're just trying to introduce a provision to discourage the owner from terminating. So essentially you're trying to punish him for terminating. It's not going to be enforced. It's going to be construed as, oh, it's, it's punitive and not liquidated damage that needs to be struck down. Um, the, the other approach is to significantly evaluate it, taking into account the investment that the operator has put into the business or is likely to put into the business over the time, and then ask for a compensation that reflects the, the real loss that it's suffering. Um, and that is likely to, to get the support of the court in, in the event of a dispute. Um, the, the other measure that we have seen in some uh, management agreements that has been adopted by operators is to have um, a distinctive um, severance of the Intellectual arrangements, arrangements are integrated is terminated because it will be disruptive of the operations of the business. So there will be a, like a phase out provision that would permit the, the owner of the hotel to continue to use um, operate under the brand name of the of the of the operator and use some intellectual property, the trademark for a particular period, and would continue to pay the fees that you know were agreed under that arrangement. And so this is one of the ways that, that you know, this is one of the options that have been put forward. Um, apologies, I need to turn this off. This is one of the options that have been put forward um, by, by different parties for the purpose of protecting the interest of both the operator and the owner in these management agreements. Again, it's important to emphasize that in these arrangements, um, especially from a lawyer's perspective, you can't approach them from, I am, I am counsel to the operator or I'm counsel to the owner. And so, you know, whatever doesn't make sense to me cannot be in the agreement. The objective has to be to strike a balance between the interest of the parties in a way that would um, ensure that the business is protected. Each party has um, significant interest to protect and to ensure that returns that is commensurate with their investment are made. Um, again, as Trevor mentioned, um, one consideration that has come to the fore, at least in the last one year, although it's preceded that, is how risk ought to be shared reasonably between the parties. Because what we've seen in the past is um, some operators who just, I, I don't, they don't care whether the business is doing well, whether it's not doing well, you know, you have these different heads of fees um, and charges that are payable to, to the operator, you know, incentive fees, the reservation fees, the base fees, the management fees, and all sort of fees. But with the incursion of things like heavy and being to the industry and different things, and especially in the context of the pandemic, what, what we have seen is a significant shift in the attitude of some operators, not, not everyone, um, in relation to, to um, insisting on their contractual rights. Um, what we've seen also on the converse is some owners, hotel owners, who have sought to, in quotes, put forward the pandemic as a first major event to terminate, 
um, hotel management agreements, a lot of them failed in, in the attempt because uh, it wasn't anticipated. You know the way force major provisions work. It must be in accordance with what the parties had actually agreed. Um, but one approach that we think can work going forward is writing into these documents hardship provisions that when X, Y, Z events happen or the business is not sufficiently sustainable based on um, market realities, parties should in good faith be able to sit down and renegotiate the terms. Um, we know that th th this is very important because a lot of hotel owners have had to um, depend on the goodwill of appraisers for the purpose of um, renegotiating fees in the past. But this is not a new trend that we think is likely to, to be on the uptick. Um, so say for instance, we had to work with a number of um, owners in the course of last year who have had to renew um, the hotel management agreement. And what we saw was um, appraisers being extant in connection with renegotiating the terms, uh, but then, you know, Owners also saying that you need to consider what's going on in the market, the global reality, and the general downward trend of the industry, you know, which, which has been going on for a while. And so these considerations are very important for the purpose of for the purpose of negotiating, um, drafting or reviewing all these all these arrangements. Um, yes. Uh, the, these again, um, Trevor has as spoken to a number of, of these issues. Um, but then, it, as I mentioned, uh, how try to spin them from a legal perspective so that that's one of the things that cause significant tension between owners and operators at the relationships um, of the parties, especially in connection with management, with, in relation to control, in relation to the to the finances and spendings in relation to the business, and this can be a, a big uh, a big issue for the parties. Sometimes you see them agreeing at the start of the relationship, but down the line, the conversations of the relationship break down, and you know parties re revert to the agreement to understand what they had earlier or initially agreed. So it's very important um, for lawyers who are drafting or negotiating these agreements to pay particular attention to them. So um, one particular head that, that you would see um, that is very contentious is this point in relation to, to cash available for, for disbursement. Um, as you may be aware, um, the owner doesn't get to draw until fees are paid, until some expenses are paid. Um, so as mentioned on the slide, it's used to test the performance of the operator um, and maybe the, the owner's uh, standard reference point when it comes to, 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 to the point of terminating their arrangements. Um, a management or operator-driven perspective is to push back um, on being accountable or being held accountable for the bottom line of the business. You don't want your... You don't want your fees or your ability to recoup your fees to be tied to, to, the, to the cash flow of the business. But from an owner's perspective, you're looking for a situation where if the business is not generating revenue, um, you want that to have an inflection on the fees payable to the operator. Um, again, it's a question of relationship. So understanding the, the interest of the parties is very important. So for, for lawyer advising an operator, um, as much as possible, um, you need to take into account the interest of the operator to ensure that um, the fees or the earnings or the returns earned by the operator is not tied to the revenue uh, flow of the business. And even if it is, it's, it's going to be subject to certain things that are um, controllable by the operator, because in reality, it's only very few things that the operator can control in relation to, to uh, occupancy rates in, in the hotel. Yes, you can do all the advertisements, you can do all the PR, you can do, you know, promote the brand. Um, but at the end of the day, it's all about um, occupancy of the hotel. So I need that is not um, 
if, if that is not generating sufficient revenue, you don't want a situation where you committed um, significant time resources um, into the operation and you are not getting any return um, simply because you are careless at the time of negotiation. And on the converse, from an owner's perspective, you need to take into account the fact that um, you may have committed significant capital to the construction, to the ongoing maintenance, you know, fitting and fixtures, furnishing, equipment, um, and the operation of the hotel. And then you're aware that this is significantly, um, this is significantly subject to the operator's fee having been paid and other expenses or deductibles having been made. And it's only what is left after that that can be swept into the owner's account for the purpose of paying you. So all these conflicting, uh, conflicting interests have to be balanced in a way that is sensible. Otherwise, uh, it will be difficult for the parties to, to move ahead. You know, as already mentioned here, you, you have the different fees that uh, operators will typically charge. And so these are things that you need to take into account. Um, there are some other considerations that in negotiating um, these arrangements from whoever's perspective that you must take into account. So taxation is very, 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 very key. Um, as already mentioned, it's, it's a head of liability that eats very deep into the revenue of, 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 of the hospitality industry. And a lot of withholding taxation and things like that. So, in, in, in representing an operator, for instance, um, council must do everything that is reasonably possible to ensure that um, taxes are not withheld. And if there are withhold, mandatory withholding tax obligations, then one way of dealing with that from an operator's perspective is to ask for gross of, uh, provisions in the, in the agreement. So much that. Um, even though taxes are withheld on the fees, um, by the time the gross up implications are, are applied, then the operator is made whole. The converse is the, is the perspective of, of the owner who would also do everything uh, possible to push back against um, tax gross up provisions in, in, in this context. And so it's very important to take all these things into account in whether reviewing or drafting or negotiating of these, these arrangements. Um, another concern that has been spiking the market now is in relation to uh, foreign exchange constraints, um, controls in the market. And so, you know, for instance, in, in Nigeria, it's the revenue of these businesses are drawn in Naira. Uh, but when you look at the, the operators, especially the international brands, um, the fees will be denominated in, in foreign currency. And so a number of questions become relevant. Um, now, whose obligation would it be to source the effects for the purpose of payment of these fees? It becomes relevant to consider whether the, the management agreement was registered with NOTA. And even if it was, um, question is, when FX is not available, there's significant um, concern about liquidity in the market. Will the owner be obliged to go and source for FX or will the Will the operator be on its own for the purpose of going to the market and sourcing a foreign exchange for the purpose of repatriating its fees? These are very important considerations again, which must be taken into account in negotiating these agreements. Um, from an owner's perspective, as much as possible, you would want to distance yourself from that. Um, you would want to think that, or you want to take the position that once the agreement is entered into um, and is in compliance with the law, and it's registered with the, with the nota uh, that the operator, who is the one uh, with the benefit of, of the registration of, of the agreement in terms of getting its fees, should be the one sourcing the FX in the event that there's any constraints in the market. Uh, but again, you need to consider the, the, the bargaining position of the party. Sometimes you may not be able to push that uh, objective. And so, Again, striking a balance between the interests of the parties is very, very fundamental. Um, you have things like insurance obligations, and you know, most appraisers would say that when um, a risk event occurs and insurance proceeds are to be paid, 
that they want to also be a loss payee in that event. Um, different questions may arise in this context. Do they have insurable interest in the assets? Um, what is the coverage of, of, of the insurance in terms of the policy? So you see some operators, so when they come in, um, you know, branded merchandise and things like that, they would have them covered under the insurance policies so that in the event that um, a risk event occurs, they can, at the minimum, get some things out of, out of the insurance process um, so as to protect their own interest. Um, from an owner's perspective, the, the, the intention or the objective would be to, as much as possible, uh, be able to get the business back or you know, the assets back. Uh, so say, for instance, if the hotel is destroyed by some fire incident or, or, or related event like flood or fire, or any other uh, what we would generally call force major event, um, natural disasters that affect the actual assets. The objective of the owner is to get the asset back in a place where it can run again. The objective of the operator, sometimes not always the case, would be to be able to, uh, if the asset cannot be get back online uh, as quickly as possible for it to continue the operation, to be in a position that where it is terminated, it's able to recruit sufficient uh, value to compensate it for the loss it has made. And so all these conflicting interests have to be, to be taken into account. We've spoken, or Trevor spoke about the concern about personnel. Again, this comes to, to, the, to the question of dichotomy between ownership and control of, of the operations of, of the business. Um, so international or, you know, reputable brands would want to come in and control everything about uh, personnel, hiring, you know, the recruitment process, um, the entire chain of staffing, remuneration, even termination. But from an owner's perspective, they want to have some visibility on how the business is run, um, so as to give them the comfort that there is no negative incentive for the operator to run in the to run the business in a way that is counterproductive to the interest of the owner. So what you see in some cases is a split. You see that the operator would come in and say that, okay, I, I'm able to concede um, the CFO position to a representative of the owner, uh, but the MD of the hotel is going to be a representative of, of the of the operator. And then, you know, you, you have all sorts of splits to just ensure that there is a balance. And it becomes more complex where you have an asset that is granted subject to a concession from the government or a third party. And so you have to balance all these interests. And as we mentioned earlier, it's, it's very important for, for, for lawyers negotiating these sorts of arrangements not to be unnecessarily legalistic in approaching them. You have to wear the commercial cap understanding the interests of the parties, understanding the, the different interests, which sometimes may not necessarily be conflicting if you lay them out properly. And sometimes they may be actually uh, conflicting. Sometimes it's a lack of understanding of the perspective of the owner or the perspective of the operator. So it's very, very important that these things are laid out. Um, okay, uh, moving on. There is um, a new concern that is, emerging in the market. We've spoken about this um, a, a little bit um, earlier, and then I, I think um, Trevor mentioned some bit of this when he was responding to one question. Consumer protection is becoming, um, a, is going to become, not that it has become, um, a concern in the market, um, yeah, especially in the hospitality industry. With the enactment of the Federal Competition and Consumer Protection Act, it's easy for people to assume that the law is simply about protecting consumers, uh, but it's way beyond that. It's also about competition in the market. It's about arrangements like franchising, it's about arrangements like management and services agreement, technical services agreement, and other sorts of arrangements. Again, as already mentioned, a, a management or operator company is concerned to ensure that it gets as many hotels under its, its brand 
um, as quickly as possible for as long as possible. These may raise concerns from a competition law perspective. And th this is equally applicable to the franchise arrangement from a regulatory perspective about how these um, contracts are entered into. Um, the restraints that are placed on owners under these arrangements. So you, you have arrangements where um, operators would say that uh, post expiration of the relationship or post termination, the owner um, has certain restrictions on who the owner can enter into a similar uh, management agreement with or franchise agreement with for a particular period. So for, from, from a legal perspective, it's very important um, why we're doing these arrangements, not just to just look at it like, okay, these agreements is consistent with the notes app, it's consistent with this. You need to take into account whether it's an agreement that in the event of a dispute post-termination or post-expiration can be enforced by the operator to protect its interest in that market. Uh, because again, the operator wants to make as much of value from the market as possible. Um, the owner also wants to make as much value as possible by entering into relationships with parties of its choice. So how these arrangements have played out can be so much diverse and the impact of the, of the FCCPA, I mean, we, we've not seen how it's going to be applied in the market, but when you look at the provisions of, of the act in different respects, you see that it prohibits um, exclusionary agreements as mentioned in the slide there. Um, you see that provisions in relation to cancellation of advance reservations, um, exclusion clauses, limitation provisions, same things that um, you think will be subject to the agreements of the parties. Um, the law has gone so far as to prohibit the inclusion of those sort of pro uh, provisions in management agreements and technical services agreements. And so in reviewing these agreements or in negotiating them in clients or even as um, an operator or as an owner of, of hotel of brands, uh, we need to take these things into account to ensure that we don't enter into an agreement that ultimately cannot be enforced in the event that is a dispute. Um, the, the last bullet points that you see is actually a very um, interesting statement that, that speaks to imposition of duty of reasonable care and skill in management services agreement. When you look at a lot of these management services agreements, you would see that um, the operator would, as much as possible, try to limit its liabilities, would also, as much as possible, make itself an agent of the owner so that in the event that there is a dispute or in the event that there is some liability to third parties, it's able to easily pass that on to the owner. What the FCCPA has effectively done is to make the operator uh, primarily liable, notwithstanding what you've agreed in, in, in the document. And, and so th th this can create some, some complex uh, relationship or dynamics or interest um, or concerns rather uh, between the parties. What can be done, you know, and depending on the context is insurance can be taken out um, in relation to, to, the, to these sorts of arrangements. Um, a, third, a third party, say for instance, parent company guarantee in relation to these sorts of liabilities can also be, be taken by the parties to ensure that in the event that these things happen, um, the operator is not ultimately exposed to the, to the liability and is able to manage it in a way that doesn't impact um, its bottom line. Um, I think that is the end of these uh, very quick conversation or presentation. Um, it, it would have been longer, but we understand that it's 15 minutes. And I think I've taken so much of the time. Um, I apologize. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lanero. Um, questions, please. Okay. I don't think there are any questions from. Yeah, but um, I have some questions for um, this time for you. Or rather, a question. I'll ask you the question and I'll ask um, Mr. Trevor the same question. So, which is the best for Nigeria franchise relationship or management relationship? 
it's that's an interesting question. There is no um there's no one size fits all. And I think um was it me or Trevor that mentioned this that the, the level of understanding of parties is very important. Um, and the relationship of the parties is also very important. So for an owner who, for instance, has operated the business for God knows how long, who understands the market, who knows where is you know, the objective, the commercial objective in the long term, may look at it and say that, okay, I, I would just rather have um, an op- uh, a franchise arrangement because I want to continue to run it. From the perspective of an owner, on the other hand, who has sell, uh, like diverse interests in different industries, who isn't concerned about um, the day-to-day operations of hotel business, but understands that the upside may be significant down the line. You may say, yeah, a management agreement or arrangement is, is the best. Um, but again, as, as I earlier mentioned, you see these arrangements are sort of integrated and now they are applied in practice. So there isn't one way that you would say that, uh, oh, this is the best for Nigeria, or that is the best for Nigeria. It's always a question of the context. I mean, Trevor has more experience dealing with this in practice than, than I do. Trevor, hello. I'm here. Hello. Okay, yes. Uh, so we'd love you to answer the question too. Which is best for Nigeria? Franchise relationship or management relationship? Well, it, it's not a question of what's best for Nigeria, it's what's best for the parties involved in a specific project. Um, franchises are very rare uh, in the hotel industry in Africa as a whole. In, in Nigeria, I, I, I think there are three um, franchises, two of which uh, became franchises because uh, of tension uh, within the management agreement that had originally been signed between owner and operator. Uh, the other was a franchise from the get-go, from one of the rare operators that will franchise. From from the owner's uh, sorry, from the operator's point of view, it, uh, uh, um, the uh, Oloniran said that a, an operator is not going to franchise to an owner who doesn't know how to manage a hotel uh, and doesn't know how to work with a brand. Because so many hotels in Nigeria and throughout most of Africa are owned by individuals or or families, Um, they don't have the experience. If you look at some of the franchises, the very few franchises that have been granted, they are to um, owners of hotels who are already operating in Africa or elsewhere, or who are engaging a third party or white label management companies such as um, Aleph or um, Patterson Dove, uh, and they will franchise to an owner who proves management capability. And that doesn't really work with just having a good general manager because good general managers leave uh, and may be replaced by somebody of a lower capacity. So we are seeing management agreements for something in the order of 90% of agreements signed throughout Africa by the chains. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, I have another question uh, for Trevor. So from experience, what has been some of the causes of conflicts between owners and operators in Nigeria? Well, the the word conflict, um, in my experience, I've seen many conflicts arising. and, and, And I have to say this is because owners lack of understanding well, of how the relationship is supposed to work and how was it was written down in, in the contract. 
um, that um, otherwise the, the agreement is there and has been structured to try and avoid conflict. So conflicts come because um, operators are charging fees and the owner doesn't want to pay those fees, um, although that had been agreed um, in, the, um, in the management agreement that those fees would be paid. Um, conflicts arise where the owner believes that the, the, the hotel should be doing better um, and that the, the operator is not contributing sufficiently to the generation of revenue and profit. Now, sometimes that is quite a valid um, reason, uh, a valid a complaint. Um, when one looks at a hotel, and uh, I know of an owner who said, Trevor, I, I look at the rooming list of this hotel, uh, for people arriving tomorrow, and the all of those people arriving tomorrow have been generated by my existing relationships. So the operator wasn't generating revenue, uh, but I but the owner brought the uh, the operator in to generate revenue. So that there, there is a genuine course of conflict there where the operator isn't performing. And, and can be shown to be not 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 um, not contributing to that revenue generation. So, um, Olani, do you have anything to contribute to the question? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, thank you. From the legal perspective, what do you think causes the conflict between owners and operators in Nigeria? No, no. As Trevor mentioned, which, which is absolutely um, on point, um, first, it's a lack of understanding. And, but that lack of understanding is always a question of not paying attention when people are negotiating their arrangements. So you have an operator um, and an owner in terms of agreements, and you see the operator is ready, you know, with its suit of lawyers, uh, you know, and the owners will just typically come, like, yeah, I'll just look at it, yeah, and then just sign the document. And then down the line, as mentioned, you know, obligation to pay these fees would start um, accruing or triggered. And then the owner will be saying, well, um, the, the, the revenue is not increasing significantly or the hotel is not performing significantly better than it was before you came in. So why should I be doing this? But then, you know, you signed up to something. Um, but on the converse also, um, sometimes it's a question of inflexibility on the part of some operators, um, not just coming to the table and simply, simply saying that um, it's take it or leave it. And a desperate owner would simply just sign up into an arrangement that the owner understands is not necessarily the most beneficial for it at that point. But then down the line, maybe the business is now doing well. It's got sufficient leverage. Now it's now making, um, making life difficult for the operator. So these things can be caused by different factors in different contexts. I'd like to just add one thing because I see a, a word that has come up on the chat and it's a word that I, I, I quite extraordinary, I don't think I've used before, uh, in, in, in this webinar, or, or, or Oleniran has, and that word is trust, that trust between the parties. I, I, I actually remember in yeah. the negotiation once upon a time where in my introduction to what we were trying to do in a, in a, in a room with the owner and, and the operator and the lawyers, I said, let's put the word trust right in the middle of this table so that we can see that word in everything we do uh, in, in, this, um, in this negotiation and going forward in the relationship, that the owner must trust the operator and the operator must earn that trust. Okay, thank you, Trevor. Thank you, Elanio. So um, with this, wonderful session we've come to the end of today thank you for the robust and interactive 
um, discussions and presentations we've had today. Um, thank you to our speakers, thank you to our sponsors, Alex, GLIS, and Co. Bloomfield Law Practice and Advocate Law Practice for making this webinar possible today. Um, please note that our next webinar series will be on Monday and it's going to be by 1 p.m. The topic will be on the future of law firm marketing. So um, please be, um, be um, available by 1 p.m. on Monday. So please don't forget to subscribe <coughs> to our YouTube channel and watch our past webinars and more webinars to come. Thank you all for attending today. Thank you to our awesome panelists for taking out time from their busy schedule to be with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you, Lanera. Thank you, Chidema. Trevor, it was nice to meet you.